And good evening and welcome to Alaska. I'm Lorraine Moffa, Programming Coordinator for Loudoun County Public Library, and it's my pleasure to introduce Patrice and Justin Levine, writers and adventurers who will give us an armchair view of what it's like to live in a cabin in Alaska. If you have any questions for Patrice and Justin, please just type them in the chat box and I'll be happy to relay them. Thanks, Justin okay. and Patrice, are you ready? Yes, Thank yes. Thank you so much to Loudoun County Public Library for having us and for Lorraine for hosting us. Um, you, if you haven't already noticed, uh, Justin and I are actually presenting in two different locations. Um, and, and this is quite unusual. Usually we're sitting right next to each other, but I'm actually in New Jersey um, taking care of my mom and he is back at our cabin in Alaska and braving the cold temperatures there. I think it's negative 20 right now, right, Justin? <laughs> Uh, warmed up to negative 19, so we're okay now. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, Alaska is a really big state, as you'll, you'll learn, and we're mostly focusing on some of the more popular Alaska subjects uh, and especially where we live. Um, we're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end. And so we do encourage people to write them in the chat as we're going along and um, we'll address those at the end. Uh, and so we'll kind of get right into it now. All right, we'll start off with a little bit about us and who are we? Um, and our story kind of starts in 2011, where Patrice and I made a drastic change in our lifestyle and we decided we live what we call now kind of a life less ordinary. Um, we sold our cars, our furniture, our home, moved everything into storage and kind of resigned from our mainstream jobs and jumped into this atypical lifestyle. And it started off with a through hike on the Appalachian Trail, all 2,181 miles. And what followed from that was a mixture of adventure, education, and some seasonal work in some unbelievable locations. Immediately following our Appalachian Trail through hike, we managed a hiker hostel on the Appalachian Trail owned by a nonprofit for a couple of years. Uh, we ran a teepee uh, lodge in Eastern Oregon. We managed a private island off the coast of Massachusetts for a while. We taught environmental education in the Hemis Mountains of New Mexico for a private school out of Albuquerque. We also worked for a nonprofit called the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics out of Boulder, Colorado, and we traveled all over the United States for three years, educating people about how to get out, outdoors responsibly and take care of our earth. Throughout this whole time, Patrice and I also worked for Backpacker Magazine. We were um, uh, writers as well as gear testers, mobile marketers going all over the United States and doing speaking tours, and we continue to do some writing today. Patrice is certainly more of a writer um, than I am, and she actually authored a book about one of our latest through hikes, our last through hike that we did in New Zealand. It was 2,000 miles across both, uh, both islands. It's called Between Each Step, and you can actually get that at the library there if you want to check it out. So people always say, like, Alaska, how, how did you get in Alaska? How, how did this come about? And it really happened in 2003. I had just met Patrice a couple of months prior to that, and I told her, listen, I got to go to Alaska. She's like, why? I'm like, well, I'm going to do my research for my master's there. And we were both living in Arizona. So I hopped in my car and drove up to Alaska, really had no idea where I was going. And I did my research in Denali National Park, developing maps on hiking trails and education in the park, as well as a backcountry guide up here. And, you know, we had just started dating, but I was so enamored with Alaska that I found a piece of land and I said, this is it. We have to buy this land. I called her up and she said, are you crazy? We just met. We're not buying land. We're, you know, that's not happening. I said, oh, you're right. I guess so. So, you know, we continue to date. And then 2006, I came up here and I was working in the cruise industry, um, doing some logistics for the cruise company. And again, I found another piece of land and I was like, oh, this is beautiful. I think we should buy this. She said, no, we're just getting married. We're, we can't buy land. We have no money. I said, oh, I understand. Okay, okay. 2016, I came up again to do some exploring in the mountains here, and uh, Patrice joined me afterwards with our nephew, and we went all over the state and did everything that tourists can do, and we just loved it. And I could see a little twinkle in her eye. She's like, mm, maybe, maybe I'm getting convinced, you know. And then in 2018 and 19, uh, the nonprofit Leave No Trace that we work for, one of our responsibilities was to do education in Alaska, specifically in Denali National Park. And as we were here, Patrice finally turned to me and said, okay, we can buy something in Alaska. So we bought a little tiny cabin that I'm sitting in right now, right on the outskirts of Denali National Park. And Patrice is gonna tell you a little bit more about that kind of ending of our nomadic years of being all over the United States. <laughs> so perhaps the first thing that you'll hear about Alaska or that you'll learn is that 
just how big it is. And you can see this picture of it splayed across the whole entire United States. Now, while Alaska is 360 million acres, we actually only have a population of 733,000 people. If you want me to compare it for Virginia, the population is 8.6 million, and you can actually fit 15 Virginias inside of Alaska. So we have a lot of land and a small population. 18% of our population is Alaska Native Indian. We have 229 tribes across the state, and the indigenous people still own 12.5% of the land. There's lots of interesting tidbits about Alaska, so get ready to be wowed. The first thing is that Russia sold Alaska to the United States in 1867 for $7.2 million, quite a deal. Alaska did not officially become a state until 1959, and it became the 49th state. When you think of Alaska, you probably think about mountains and glaciers. Glaciers cover 5% of our whole state. We have 100,000 glaciers, more than any other state. We have 3,000 rivers, and many of which are glacially fed. We'll talk a little bit about some of those later. Um, and we have 3 million lakes. Now, 17 of the 20 highest uh, peaks in the United States are actually in Alaska. We have 19 peaks over 14,000 feet, so lots of elevation. We'll talk about Denali a little later. That's the highest peak in North America. Alaska borders two oceans, the Pacific and the Arctic. We have 34,000 miles of coastline, and that is more than the other 49 states combined. Now, among our vast land, we have only 15 highways. Most areas, especially our native villages, are only accessible via plane. Now I can go on and on, but we are gonna kind of dig deeper into a few Alaska specific subjects. Some of those subjects are, what do people do up here? The 700,000 people, what do we do? We all don't just live off the land. We all do work up here. And uh, Patrice and I is gonna tell you a little bit about our work, but the number one industry in Alaska is oil and you know i bet you russia's kicking themselves for selling this but uh oil um is the big industry up here uh and the pipeline is a huge huge thing in alaska it was uh constructed in 1977 at a cost of about eight billion dollars um, a lot of people came up here to work on the pipeline and it spans 800 miles uh, from northern Alaska at Prudhoe Bay all the way to Valdez. And it's a huge, huge pipe that you can see. Um, half of it is buried in the ground. The other half spans, you know, over rivers and across land. And if you actually land in Fairbanks, you can drive 15 minutes and go visit the pipeline. Uh, it represents about 25% of the U.S. oil production. So we get this question a lot. People are always asking us, don't you get paid to live in Alaska? And we don't get paid to live in Alaska, but in 1980, they established something called the Permanent Fund Dividend. And what that is, is a trust fund that shares um, oil revenue profits with state residents. So anyone over the age of one who lives in Alaska full time, you can't just leave in the winter, you have to live here full time, gets a check every October. Um, and it can range from a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars. I think this past year, I think we got about thirteen hundred dollars. Um, you know, we've got six hundred, seven hundred. We've got upwards of three thousand. And it certainly does help. Um, things in Alaska are quite expensive. Now, when I talk about the pipeline and oil, most people think about the big disaster that happened up here in 1989. The Exxon Valdez was the largest oil spill in history, spilling 11.3 million gallons of oil into Prince William Sound, which is southern Alaska there. And in four days, it covered 300 square miles. Um, it killed thousands of birds and marine life and uh, scientists and people still see the effects of that oil spill today. Another big industry in Alaska is fishing. And if you wanna make some big bucks, you can come up to Alaska and work a couple months during the fishing season and live off that money. Uh, it is a very dangerous job. I know you guys have probably seen TV shows about fishing up here, but it's it's a big industry up here. Um, Alaska produces more seafood than all the other states combined. About 80% of our seafood is exported. Um, it provides about two thirds of the nation's seafood. Um, I know my mom gets Alaskan salmon all the time down in Colorado, always telling us about it. And um, we have about 600 and 
20 species of fish, of course, halibut, trout, trout, and crab, but the salmon is probably the most important and what people seek to come up here and get. And uh, we certainly do fish up here. Fishing is an important part of our life as well as subsistence living, especially among the native populations here. But one thing that we do in Alaska, it's a little bit different than traditional cast and reel fishing, is Alaska residents are allowed to do something called dip net fishing. You can see some pictures there. And what it is, it's maybe you know, 15 foot pole with a massive net on the end. What you do is you throw on some life jackets, some ropes, harnesses, maybe you tie off onto some trees and you stick those nets into raging rivers where the salmon are swimming upstream. Try to find places where they're, you know, getting turned around like little eddies or stuff like that. Scoop them up. I bring them to shore, Patrice bonks them and gets them ready. And that's how we get our salmon for our season. And you can see we uh, we get them all filleted, we vacuum seal them, and we have a freezer outside full of salmon. And we try to eat salmon about once a week up here. Uh, the another big industry in Alaska, of course, is tourism. And this is uh, probably why a lot of you are tuning in. I hope so. Some of you are thinking about maybe coming to Alaska, or maybe some of you are reliving some great memories in Alaska. And this is this is like another world coming up here. Um, approximately 2 million people a year visit Alaska and about 70% of them come via cruise ship. And that is a great way to explore Alaska. Patrice and I have done that going from Vancouver for Seattle, coming up the inside passage. You get to see spots where you cannot drive to. You can't get to those through Canada. So taking a cruise up here is certainly great. Um, and then you end up in Southern Alaska. And of course, there's a lot of things to do in Alaska. People come here for those sceneries and mountains that Patrice was talking about, those big glaciers, maybe some Northern lights if you try to venture in the winter. But most of our visitors of those 2 million people come between the months of May and September, and that's the best time to visit. And I think a lot of people come up here for the nature and the vast land. We have eight national parks here that make up 42 million acres of land. That's the size of the state of Wisconsin. And about a half million people a year come here to visit those national parks with Denali National Park right there in our backyard being the most popular. Now of the national parks, the four largest national parks in size are in Alaska. And so there's a lot more to do up here besides, you know, going to the national parks. As I said, taking that cruise ship up is a great thing to do, but there's a lot to do in the interior. And uh, you can do things from gold panning. We've taken our nephew and done that. You can do that all over Alaska and you truly can find gold. Um, another great place to visit is North Pole, Alaska, right outside of Fairbanks. And I actually lived in North Pole for a little bit and it is exactly what you think. It is all dedicated to Santa and Mrs. Claus and you can visit them 365 days a year. They're there to hang out. It's a huge village with reindeer and of course a lot of shopping. And Patrice and I go there about once a year to do our Christmas shopping. But perhaps the one thing that I suggest people do is if you are going to take a cruise here um, or maybe fly it into southern Alaska, we always suggest that people take the train. And this is not your ordinary train. This is a, a double double tier train with glass dome top um, that goes through places where the roads don't go. And you can take this train all the way from exiting the cruise ship all the way up to Fairbanks. And it could stop along the way in Anchorage and Talkeetna and Denali and Fairbanks. And it's just a great way to explore Alaska taking the train. Whenever we have visitors come, we do encourage them to take the train and not rent a car. So, as Justin said, we live just outside of Denali National Park in Healy, which is in the middle of the state, and that's called Interior Alaska. Our small community of Denali Borough has a population of less than 1,000 people in the winter, but it goes up to 4,000 people in the summer because of all the seasonal workers that come to work for the National Park and for the businesses outside the park. The main industry in our area is tourism. But we also have the state's only coal mine, which has powered our electrical grid since the 1940s. Now, Denali Borough is five hours north of Anchorage, where the population is 288,000. So lots of people down in the big city of Anchorage. And then we're also two hours south of Fairbanks, which has a population of 40,000 people. Now, Healy has gas stations and a small grocery store, but no hospitals, dentists, doctors. Justin and I do most of our food shopping two hours north in Fairbanks because it is a better variety of stores and better pricing. Our borough does have restaurants and lodging open in the summer, but pretty much everything is closed in the winter, so there's not much to do. And you're probably wondering, well, what, is, what do we do for work? Well, Justin and I have multiple jobs, including hiking guides in the summer, 
uh, Airbnb managers, and we are writers, as Justin mentioned. And so summer is our busiest time for work. In the winter, we're kind of more so hibernating, like the bears. <laughs> now, Denali is one of Alaska's eight national parks, as Justin already mentioned. It encompasses 6 million acres. So for perspective, that's the size of Massachusetts, but with no development. There's one 90 mile road that goes in and out of the park and private vehicles can't drive past mile 15. Instead, there are bus tours that take you that normally go all the way back to mile 90, but there was a landslide in uh, 2021 and it's closed the road at mile 43. They hope to reopen it in the next couple of years, but still getting back into the park is a great way to see. Most people do come, of course, to see our wildlife, which we will talk about later, and Denali, the tallest peak in America. A bus tour is a great way to do that. Now, one thing that's surprising, to people is that there's no guarantee that you'll see either. We call it the 30% club, and that's the percent of people who come into the park and actually catch a glimpse of Denali. The weather changes constantly, and especially in the mountains. Now, hiking is a great way to explore the park, and there are 35 miles of established marked trails that are close to the front entrance of the park. If you're more adventurous, you can certainly go into the backcountry. You could take that bus and you can go backpacking or just go day hiking. The park has an organized permit system divided into units. Now, the cool thing about the backcountry is that there are no trails. So you're truly going off into the bush. Now, Justin and I do this quite often, but I have to admit that the first time that I went um, backpacking out in the backcountry years and years ago, I was really nervous about encountering bears and having to navigate without a trail. Of course, now I feel extremely confident and I feel like I'm very much bear aware and I also always carry my bear spray. And it's pretty amazing to be out in the wild. So Patrice mentioned, you know, the 30% club of people that get to see Denali. And I came up here in 2003 and I saw that mountain and I was like, that thing is unbelievable. I'm going to climb that someday. And I told Patrice that and she goes, what do you mean? You don't even know what an ice ax or a crampon or a rope is. I said, I know, but someday I'm going to try that. So I spent years and years climbing in the lower 48 and learning rope technique and all this. And then in 2016, I made an attempt to climb Denali. Now, this is no walk in the park. You can't just go go hike it. We've had people ask us, oh, can we just go hike Denali? That's not what you do. Um, it's one of the seven summits. So what that means, it's the highest peak in North America. And of the seven summits, it's actually the most difficult to climb. And some of you are probably thinking, well, what about Mount Everest? That's 29,000 feet. And you are correct, but Denali has more vertical gain than Everest. And what Denali has is no support. You are not allowed to hire a Sherpa or a porter to um, carry any of your equipment. You can hire a guide to guide you, but you can't, you have to carry everything on your own. So your backpack can weigh anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds. And then you're pulling a sled full of gear and food that can be anywhere from 70 to 100 pounds behind you. Um, typically, uh, the, about a thousand is people try to attempt it every year. It has about a 50% success rate. It's a very weather dependent mountain. Also, time is not on your side. The best time to climb it is May through about mid July. And it's no walk in the woods. It doesn't take a couple days. If you can do it in 15 days, that is an accomplishment. It takes anywhere from 15 to about 25 days to prepare. Um, it, you don't need oxygen. Um, you don't need, really need oxygen up above 23,000 when you start needing oxygen, but certainly your oxygen is deprived as you're going higher and higher. And what it is with Denali, since you don't have support, you have to carry everything on your own. So you are hiking and climbing this mountain, setting up your camp, and then the next day you grab everything that you don't need for a couple days and you climb as high as you can, maybe a couple hundred feet, maybe a couple thousand feet. Then you dig a massive hole in the snow and you bury all of your stuff. You mark it and you come back down all the way to your camp, go to bed and the next day, hopefully wake up, pack up everything, hike beyond everything you buried, set up your next camp. And so you're shuttling your stuff up and down the mountain. So basically you're climbing this mountain twice. Um, as I said, very weather dependent in 2016, uh, we experienced gust of winds up to 80 miles per hour, temperatures dipping into the negative 50s. We spent 11 days in our tent hunkering down in a storm. And after 23 days, we actually turned back just a couple hundred feet from the top. But that mountain will always be there. And 
Patrice knows I always have desires to go do it again. And I could probably do a whole presentation about Denali, but we'll kind of move on and talk a little <laughs> bit more about life in Alaska here. So Justin and I own two properties uh, in Healy, a cabin and a yurt. Now we live in the 300 square foot cabin while the yurt is for our friends and family, as well as a seasonal Airbnb rental. Now both properties are dry and you're probably wondering what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that we don't have traditional plumbing and a septic. Instead, we use an outhouse to do our business. There's our outhouse there. Um, and that includes in the winter when it's well below zero. It makes life very exciting. Now, most homes in our area are dry, mainly because it's a seasonal community, but also because it's difficult and expensive to dig a well. There's no city water line or sewer. The homes that do have traditional systems tend to experience challenges in the winter. If they go away, they need somebody to house it and make sure they run the water. Um, instead, most people live in the dry cabins. And so that means that they haul their water from community wells and they have creative water holding tanks. Now in our cabin and our yurt, we utilize a gray water drain directly from both during the summer. But in the winter, we use a bucket system. So that means that we wash and rinse dishes and buckets, and then we broadcast the water outside. As for a shower, we heat water on the stove, then we shower in a large silver basin that you see in that picture, and then we dump the water outside. Very pioneer-like. So Alaska really makes you notice the seasons and weather patterns. And in our area, we typically only receive about 80 inches of snow each year. In 2022, we did have a record snowfall of 176 inches. And oftentimes we have snow from September until May. Now we also do have permafrost. That's probably a word that you've heard. It's all around the state. That means that the ground remains frozen and it can go as deep as 2000 feet. Now permafrost is another reason why digging wells and septic septics are, is a hard thing to do. Hardly anyone in Alaska has a basement. Now more than the snow uh, in Alaska is the cold. We typically experience many days of 20 below and as I said, Justin is right now in temperatures of 20 below. It's been pretty cold there the last couple of weeks and the coldest that we ever experienced or I ever experienced at the cabin was negative 38, but he broke the record last week. And what'd you say it was? It was negative 44? Yep. Yeah. So the cold definitely makes life more challenging. And obviously we have to plug in our vehicles at certain temperatures and be mindful about things freezing that you wouldn't even think about. But more than the um, the cold is that the light and the the darkness in in the state. Winter solstice in our area means that we have four hours and twenty minutes of daylight. Where we live, we don't actually see that flaming ball of sunlight because the surrounding mountains um, are cover is covering it, and that's usually from May until January. And Justin said that he just saw the ball of sun. Last week, it just popped up over the mountains just a little bit for a couple minutes. Right now, we're actually up to about seven hours of daylight, but it's still, you know, it's still, it's still a shorter day. On the flip side, we have those long days in the summer. Summer solstice in our area means that we have about 21 hours of daylight. And that's why Alaska has that nickname, Land of the Midnight Sun. So... The little bright side to all of the darkness are the northern lights, and you can see them, but you need to come here in the winter. And us not having water and having run into the outhouse all the time affords us the opportunity to see those northern lights quite often. Uh, typically, we see them September through April. I'd say the best times are like October, November, December, January. I saw them the other night. They were absolutely beautiful. And auroras are just charged electrons and protons. Um, they're coming, uh, flowing through the sun and the atmosphere and gases and creating these lights. And they occur in two different bands. So you have the Antarctic Circle and you have the Arctic Circle. And that's why we see them in Alaska, because we're at a higher latitude at 64 degrees north. Um, and ours are called Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights. And we mostly see green lights um, as they're closest to the Earth, but there are times that we do see purple or pink or different colors kind of shooting through the sky. Um, we don't ever get sick of them. We do enjoy them. 
Um, we keep a camera at the end of the bed there um, and with a tripod. If one of us is outside, you know, utilizing the outhouse and sees the northern lights, we always tell the other, come on out. And we're always like, well, is it better than the night before? You know, got to get all bundled up to go out. But it certainly is worth it. Um, we do encourage people to come up here in the winter. The best place to go experience the northern lights would be flying into Fairbanks. And they do some northern lights tours as well as um, places that you can go to see them up there. So the other thing about Alaska, and Patrice kind of touched upon this before, is the wildlife. And uh, people always ask us, you know, do we have wildlife? And yes, we do have wildlife. We see many types of wildlife just right outside our door. The animals we see most around our home are moose. We probably see those like you see deer everywhere. We have caribou that kind of wander through our property in the street. Um, and then we have lynx. We have a lot of lynx. Um, and you can see there's a lynx sitting right there at the outhouse. We kind of have a residence lynx that kind of wanders around. Lynx are, are super friendly, you just kind of shoo them away. But we have a lot of snowshoe hares around the property. So the lynx like to eat the snowshoe hares. So come spring, we go around the property and clean up all the snowshoe hare carcasses. Um, but what people really are excited about to come up here are the bears. And do we have bears? Yes, we do. We have three types of bears here. We have black bears, which you guys have obviously down there. And we have the big brown grizzly bears. And then we do have polar bears. Um, in the state, we probably have about uh, 30,000 grizzly bears uh, statewide, about 98% of all the grizzlies in the United States are mainly in Alaska. Um, around our area directly, we have about 400 grizzly bears. Um, we typically don't see a lot of bears around our house, maybe once or twice a year. We mainly see those if we're going into the back country or into the park. Um, and then we do have polar bears here. Now, polar bears are way up north, kind of Prudhoe Bay, that area where I was showing you um, the pipeline comes in. Um, and we have been up there. Unfortunately, we have not seen a polar bear in the wild. Um, there's about 7,000 polar bears up there. Now, most people with the bears, they're very scared and nervous about them. And Patrice and I being guides, we always carry bear spray with us. We actually don't carry a gun. And um, typically the bears are more afraid of us than we are of them. They run away immediately. We make noise and we do see bears um, often, not a lot. The animal that we're more afraid of, of up here are the moose. And um, moose are certainly far more aggressive, um, especially cow moose with their young. We've been charged by moose uh, quite a few times, Patrice a lot more than myself. And we had our most, our most dangerous one was last year and it was simply walking around our neighborhood on a little walk in the evening, um, we got charged by a mom moose and it was quite quite scary. So we're always telling people to keep their eyes out for the moose um, and uh, just being careful with them. Uh, the other animal that we have, it's not really an animal up here, it's more of an insect, are mosquitoes. And we have 25 species of mosquitoes and we kind of refer though to them as our state bird. And I, I kid you not, they are quite big. And if you're going to come up here in June or July, we suggest wearing head nets like you can see me wearing right there, bringing bug spray with you. Um, you know, we always say, oh, we're used to them. But yeah, they're, they're not they're not the best, the mosquitoes here. The cool thing is the things that we don't have up here. We don't have any poison ivy or poison oaks. So you don't need to worry about that. We don't have any snakes. We don't have any ticks. There's no raccoons or skunks up here. You know, we just got these big animals kind of running around. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So many of you have probably heard about the Iditarod or the last great race. Now, dog teams have always offered a means of transportation during Alaska winters. And the Iditarod is actually a reconstruction of the route for dog mushers bringing medicine to native communities. It began in 1973 and every year in March, about 50 mushers race teams of sled dogs a thousand miles across Alaska. In 2022, Justin and I started volunteering for the Iditarod. To put on such a massive event, uh, the organizers need about 2,000 volunteers, and duties include anything from communications, logistics, shuttle drivers, trail crew, veterinarians, dog handlers, pilots, food packers. Um, Justin and I are part of the trail crew, so there's 22 remote checkpoints along the route, and we work as trail crew at a different spot every year. What does a trail crew do? Well, basically we we help park the dogs when they came in, they come into a checkpoint, and then we scoop their poop when they leave. So it's a very, very important job. Now, Alaska is one of the few states um, that does not have casinos or and only has local lot lotteries. 
One example is the annual ice classic, and that's a betting pool to guess the time to the nearest minute of the ice breakup on the river. That's right, folks, we bet on when a river will crack, indicating spring for us. And it's all very official, as there's a tripod connected to a watchtower in the community of Nanana just north of us. And when the tripod tips, it stops the clock to the minute. Now, tickets cost $3 a piece, and anyone can participate, but you do have to buy the tickets in person in Alaska. Typically, the prize is split. It's usually a couple hundred thousand dollars. And my Uncle Fred has actually lived in Alaska for the last 40 years, so I've always known about the Nanana Ice Classic because he would call my mom and say, okay, get your guesses in. We're going to win this year. He's never won in his 40 years. So uh, some things about Alaska, earthquakes and volcanoes. Do we have them? We do, and we have about 130 volcanoes uh, throughout Alaska. About 50 of them have been active in the last 300 years. And typically we see about two volcanic eruptions a year here. Now, typically they're way south down in the Aleutian Islands and they don't really cause much damage or destruction and we don't hear about them much. Um, our last big eruption that kind of happened more closer to Anchorage was in 2009 uh, when Mount Redoubt um, exploded and you know caused some damage and some, some uh, volcanic ash to go around. But uh, a cool thing about Alaska, besides volcanoes, are earthquakes. And most people believe that California is the earthquake capital of the United States. And in fact, it is not. Alaska has about 50 to 100 earthquakes a day here. I kid you not. We have a ton of earthquakes. Now, most of them are one, two, three on the Richter scale. You don't really feel them or you feel them a little bit. But the largest earthquake in U.S. history and the second largest earthquake ever happened here in Alaska in 1964 in March. Um, it was a 9.2, happened in southern Alaska, um, the Prince William Sound region of Alaska. It lasted three minutes. It killed over 100 people, caused a massive tsunami that wiped out a lot of Alaska. You can see pictures of them, Anchorage of the street buckled. And um, a lot of this was felt down in the lower 48. People said down in Washington and Montana and all that, they did feel this earthquake and throughout Canada. Um, in the last... Uh, five years, we've had about 30 um, earthquakes that have been more than a 6.0 on the Richter scale. And in fact, just last week, we had a 5.8 and I was sitting here working and certainly felt it shake the cabin away. Um, now, if you look at this map here, you can see that there's all these dots here. And what this means is everything that you see in yellow is an earthquake that's happened in the last week. Everything in red is an earthquake that's happened in the last 24 hours. So you can see we certainly do have a lot of quakes. Um, and I think the largest Patrice and I ever experienced, I mean, it's just is over six. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it's a safe assumption that most of you like to read since this is a library program. Um, the, uh, I put up a, a slide of all different books that Justin and I have read that are about Alaska. There's no shortage of books about Alaska. And most of these up here are nonfiction, so true stories. Um, we mentioned that we live in Healy, just outside of Denali National Park. And perhaps one of the more famous stories that came out of Alaska is called Into the Wild by John Krakow. And this is about a, a young man who came to Alaska and just went off into the bush. And that area where he went off to is just right in our backyard um, and found a, a famous bus that the magic bus, as he called it. So it's a it's a good um, book that became a movie, too. So just something that if you're interested in adventure stories, um, we're also really big fans of Iditarod books and um, the book in the middle that says Cold Hands, Warm Heart. That's by Jeff King. He's actually our neighbor. Um, he lives in Denali Borough. Lots of dog mushers in our area um, and all across the state. And there's a lot of books about the Iditarod. So those are always really good stories. They do some, I mean, they experience some crazy things on that race. Of course, we're also interested in books about climbing Alaska, and uh, that book that I just circled, Denali's Howl, is our favorite. And so, as you can probably guess, you know, we like all the adventure books, and like I said, there's just no shortage of any of those when it comes to Alaska.
So we want to thank you all for joining us and, and thank you to Loudoun County Public Library again for having us and Lorraine for hosting us. Um, we put up our information up there. Um, if you, We are always happy to answer questions. If you're planning a trip to Alaska, you can reach out to us via email or um, on our website too. You can reach out to us. Um, we have lots of resources on our website. So we definitely want to open it up for questions. I'm not sure if any came on through the chat, but Lorraine probably will pop back on and let us know. Hi. 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 So we have one question here. I had no idea when climbing Denali, you would have to run up your supplies only to return to camp. I didn't know that either. Yeah. So because on Everest, you have um, uh, porters and Sherpas that carry your gear for you, as well on, on Kilimanjaro in Africa and places like that, they carry your gear. Um, because this is located in a national park, you can't hire people to do that. You can hire guides, and I'd say about 70% of the people that climb do go with a guiding service, but you have to carry your own weight. So, yes, you are shuttling your stuff up and down the mountain. Um, and that's that's how you do it. <laughs> um, what was the hardest thing you had to adjust to moving to Alaska? And and how often do you leave? So I'll, I'll take that question probably, yeah. Justin, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me, the hardest thing was the darkness. Um, I didn't really expect it to be that bad because we've lived it all over the country. And so we've been in higher la latitudes, but, you know, the, just having spending the winter, a full winter in Alaska, um, I realized uh, the first year that we spent our full winter there, I was like, oh, this is awesome. It's so fun. This is exciting. And then the second year I thought, well, gee, this is kind of, um, you really do get cabin fever very quickly, especially living in a 300 square foot cabin when you don't have, we're freelancers, so we get to make our own schedules. So we didn't really have to leave, but, you know, and it was a little too cold to go out. We're very active, so we try to go out once a day, whether it's to the post office or maybe for a snowshoe or a ski outside of our door. But, um, you know, losing that light is, it was really hard for me to watch. So. I would say that I make Justin leave every November ish when we are losing light leading up to that winter solstice, um, December 21st. So any time during that time, I'm like, okay, that's, that's our time to visit family or go on a little vacation. This year we went to Mexico for a little bit while well, we did our little family visits as well. But I, I force him to leave. I think he probably would be okay with it. And maybe you can answer it differently, Justin, if there's a different hard thing for you about moving to Alaska. Yeah, Patrice said, yeah, I mean, I, I think what's difficult, I think, is, and I, I like it, but is the lack of services that we have in our community. Um, uh, we don't have anything. So if you want your hair cut, got to go two hours north. You want to get your nails done, two hours north. You have a medical emergency, two hours north. The only hospital is in Fairbanks. So there's only one hospital in Fairbanks. It's not that good of a hospital. So if something medically goes wrong here, you need to rely on our community. We don't have any doctors or nurses or anything like that here. Um, we do have an airstrip near our house and Patrice and I buy medevac insurance where a plane or a helicopter can come pick us up if it really gets bad. But uh, Patrice has had to drive me to the hospital um, as fast as she could. Um, you know, two hours, she made it an hour and a half. But uh, I think the lack of medical services and, you know, I think growing old in Alaska is going to be very difficult. I don't think we can be 60, 70, 80 years old, trudge into our outhouse when it's negative 40 out or, you know, getting sick um, and trying to go to the hospital in Fairbanks. So I think that's one of the obstacles. I mean, we like it. We don't go to Fairbanks a lot. We go maybe once a month or every other month we try to go. Um, but also our community is very supportive. So we're tight knit. We all know each other. Um, we don't lock our doors. You know, we leave our cars running, keys in your car and people look out for each other here. So if you are going to town and you need a prescription or Fairbanks, we call it, you need a prescription, someone will pick it up for you. You can just say, we have a little you know, Facebook page. Anybody going to can pick up my prescription and bring it home? Sure, I'm already there. I'll be there right now. Can you stop at the store and get this for me? Yeah, no problem. So I think that's kind of a difficult thing. And, and you asked about leaving. Yeah, we can leave, but we go Fairbanks to Seattle. So we live at Seattle airport all the time <laughs> and then Seattle to wherever we need to go, whether it's East coast or, you know, Mexico or anywhere like that. Okay. How was rock climbing scuba? Huh? Yeah, I would say that I don't think 
we don't have any rock climbing really in our area. Um, the the rock is very like schist like. Um, yeah. So it's so loose. like tech tech no technical rock climbing here. Um, we we were we were climbers. We would climb and sport climb, and there's no there's no there's little bouldering areas, but there's no technical rock climbing. People I mean, do ice climb though. They do ice climb. You do ice climb and then mountaineering. I mean that's what's big here is you know long expeditions and going into the Alaska Range or the Chugach or something like that and and doing expeditions and then and scuba i think I, we have some friends who went scuba diving down in the lucia island aleutian islands last year but yeah i i don't know too many people that go scuba diving yeah that's that's gotta be cold we don't know many i mean when we go so when we go rafting here in our rivers oh. our rivers are glacially fed um which means the temperature is just above freezing and we wear a dry suit which is basically a huge plastic bag we don't wear a wetsuit we don't wear raincoats and uh you know, if you fell in these rivers just plain clothed, you'd be gone in a couple minutes. And with a dry suit, you have about 45 minutes that you could survive um, in, in a dry suit. So when we go paddling, we wear that. Um, uh, scuba diving, I would assume it's it's cold water. You got to know what you're doing. We're not scuba divers. So. What a, what about cross country skiing? Uh, my skis are right there at the front door. We put them on and ski right from our front door and go so, everywhere all the time. All the time. Yeah, so we have snowshoes and skis at our front door. And so that yurt that Patrice showed that we own, we can't get to that in the winter, um, but by driving, we have to ski or snowshoe to it, but it's shut down right now. So, but we go check on it, um, but we ski and snowshoe all around the neighborhood. How long does it take you to start your car in the winter and how often are roads undrivable? Yeah, so um, we so we plug in our car when it's below zero. Um, tell, tell them what that means. Why we plug it oh, in? Okay, so uh, when you plug in the car in Alaska, there's like this plug coming out the front. All Alaska cars, and it's a battery warmer, an oil pan heater, and what's the engine block heater? Engine I block think. heater. Yeah. So we have, so yeah. that kind of gets your car like ready, so it's not a cold start. It's more for the longevity. Some of the newer cars have no problem starting with cold temperatures. Um, but it's more for like the longevity of those things so they're not working as hard so we tend to you know we'll we'll auto start our car um when we're going out and um and just kind of get it warmed up a little bit so it's not working so hard and they do so we live on a road that gets plowed um it does take like a day for them to plow it but um, the main road that goes through denali borough is actually one of the 15 highways and so that pretty much always gets plowed. Um, now they plow, but there's always a layer of snow. And it, I know it doesn't make sense to people that like you're driving on snow, but it's packed down snow. And the difference with snow in Alaska versus say New Jersey where I am is that our snow is never melting. So because we're below, we're usually below freezing the whole winter. Um, and so that packed down snow is not slippery. It's not icy. It's just like, um, it's hard to describe, but there's no humidity in it. So it's not icy. It's not like it's melting and refreezing and melting and refreezing yeah. until the spring. Yeah. And everyone up here has, you know, big trucks or Subarus and a prerequisite is having auto start and heated seats. It's, it's pretty necessary to have that here. Um, yeah. And, and. Yeah, I mean, we just don't have a lot of moisture in our snow. So a lot of times it's blowing around and there's huge drifts. Yeah, like when we when we get snow, if we're gone and we come back we, a week after it snowed, we can just sweep it usually. Do you prefer summer or winter? Well, it's hard know. to say. I mean, you know, we moved to this place because we love it. And the summer is very crowded. There are tourists everywhere. But we chose to move here be, because of that. We love that. Um, but when the tourists leave come mid September, I mean, we do love it here. There's nobody so here. I mean, I have no neighbors. Um, uh, it, it is quite lonely and especially lonely now that Patrice isn't here with me. Um, but you know, I don't know. I mean, I love, I love the summer. I love taking people out hiking and coming up here and who've never done this. Like we go hiking and it's a lot different than Virginia or hiking in the lower 48. We're not going on trails. We're taking people to the Alaska bush where we pull over bushwhack through this and go, let's go climb that mountain right there. Mm -hmm. And people are, are floored by that and the, where we don't see anyone, you know, and so it's, it's, it's an eye opening experience. And so I don't know what I like better. 
Yeah, I think I mean I I have love I have a love for all the seasons um for different reasons. I think Justin put it right. I mean it's very crowded in the summer, very crowded. Yeah. And I bet it wouldn't seem crowded to us. Probably no, you're, it, you're definitely right. You're absolutely correct. So we come here and if we do if we do go on a trail in Denali National Park and we take people on trails, I always say to people, "Okay, so we just did that hike. How many people did you see?" I didn't see anyone. I said, this is the most popular trail in the national park and you saw zero people. Yeah. So I, I sometimes yeah. warn my my clients, I say, oh, well, um, we might see some people on this trail. And if we see five people, I'm like, I'm sorry, it was crowded today. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you plan your meals with a grocery store being two hours away? It's called a, a healthy dose of OCD. Mm, her Patrice, yeah. I um I'm I'm very much like a, a meal planner and we've lived remotely all over the country. Um and so you know we've kind of gotten used to that whole idea where you need to stock up and so we, we plan our meals so that we have certain ingredients that can be for several different meals and yeah, we can grocery shop um for Get away with like six weeks before we run out of things and I, a lot of people always say well what about produce well alaska it's very hard to come across fresh produce anyway so we'll get things and it'll last for as long as it lasts and then when we run out of that we you rely on like frozen vegetables or canned goods but we also like you know come august patrice and i are out picking blueberries so our freezer right now is stocked full of blueberries of course we have all of our salmon and halibut We've got fresh moose in the freezer. Um, I don't think we have any caribou right now, but uh, but we 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 stock up, and we have a massive freezer, um, and not in our three hundred square foot cabin, just kind of out in the shed there. Um, yeah, yeah, it's tough, but we do have. I'm not. We do have a little store in town, and we can go there, but it's very overpriced. They buy stuff from Costco and break it up. And There's a like watermelon that. there. They sell watermelon there in the summer. That's ten dollars. Mm. Well, I can't get over camping in the middle of, you know, open country because because of the animals. I mean, how do you get over that fear? How do you prepare yourself so you feel confident enough to do that? Well, we're animal aware. Um, both Patrice and I are trained on how to react to these animals. So, you know, I mean, this summer I had a couple from. Alabama that I took backpacking who had never been camping in their life. And I went backpacking oh with them gosh. and I, I just explain every time I talk to them and I, we educate them. Um, you know, we're very good with navigation. Um, I mean, we're not going on trails. And when I take, do these trips, I turn to people and I say, which way do you want to go? And they said, let's try that way. I said, that sounds great. Let's go that way for a day or two and see how that goes. So, um, and, and yeah, do you Justin anything, said, you know, just being, uh, aware of the wildlife and how you act with each thing. I think bears are always the thing that people think about. And, you know, like when you're camping, there are certain practices that you just really want to be in place, uh, put in place. And you just have to be hyper aware. And we make a lot of noise when we're when we're in like a bush area where there's a lot of trees and where there could be bears around. And so you just make that noise. And usually nine times out of 10, the bears will go away before you even see them. Yeah. I mean, there's there's silly things that you never think of, like when we stop and take a break or we're going to have lunch or dinner, we'd all we all face each other and look at each other and talk. We all face the other way so we can see what's going to come up upon us, if anything is. And we usually I mean, I've been like down. a clearing. Yeah, or yeah. Or, or where you're going to camp or store your food or you're not cooking next to your tent ever. You're not trying not to sleep in the clothes that you cook in, um, you know. I, we sleep with our bear spray right next to our head, just in case the bear comes up to us. I mean, I've unzipped my tent and seen, you know, five or six bears in the distance out, outside my tent milling about. But, you know, as long as they know we're no threat and we're not getting close to them, it works out. Um, yeah. but do you, but you, had, have you ever used your bear spray? I have not. I've sprayed Neither myself. With, I sprayed myself with it once by mistake. It went oh. off my face. Um, I dropped it. Awful. Yeah, and it does work. And we and we do training. Um, when we go out, we don't just say, "Okay, let's go for a hike." We spend several several minutes, if not fifteen thirty minutes, talking to people about this is how we do. Here's the what ifs. Here's in my backpack. Here's emergency. We carry emergency um, locator because no cell phones work here. So we carry either um, a sat phone or emergency communicator. We carry first aid kits. We teach people how to use the bear spray. If I have a large group, I'm not the only one carrying the bear spray. I'm carrying it and maybe one or two other people are carrying it and we teach them. Yeah. yeah. Interesting.
Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your life with us. It sounds just so exciting. It really does. You're welcome. Yeah. We love sharing super, it. it. Like it's someone exciting. said, super interesting. It really is. Yeah. And then it, I it's envy a, you the quiet. I really do. That must be something. It is something. I mean, whenever we go visit my family in Denver or her, her mom in New Jersey, it, it's quite loud for us. And, and yeah. Cars. And then we don't have. For there's no traffic lights for let me think about this maybe uh, three three hundred miles, two hundred miles maybe yeah, yeah the lights I think so yeah a hundred miles at least a hundred miles Justin at least yeah yeah yeah. But do you have a plan for what's next? Uh, no, no. no I, I like to tell Justin that I have a ten year shelf life left for our life in Alaska. Um, he <laughs> says fifteen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure you'll stay in great shape living there. Yeah, we do, and we we enjoy it. It's it's we call it a simple life, but it's quite hard. I mean, we do think we're like twenty years behind the time here, but you got to work for everything here. I mean, it's tough. Um, you know, as Patrice but that said, that keeps you healthy in a lot of ways. Yeah, it does. It? it does. I mean, ideally, we'd love to stay here. Um, you know, we live a very tiny, small footprint, very simple. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, maybe you'll move to a city in Alaska. Oh, <laughs> <Quite> a <laughs> city. Well, last uh, Anchorage is a big city to us. We only go there maybe once or twice a year. It's it's like very crazy for us. And so. I like to say that Alaska ruined you because once you live here and now I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to live somewhere else and have right. people around. Yeah, there's nothing else like that, really. <laughs> well, good for you. Thank you for sharing it with us and uh, good luck. Yeah, yeah it's been a Thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.